Welcome to the uh, EDPF Summit. Uh, I'm Jed Salazar. And I'm Natalia Ivanko. And today we're going to be talking about how to keep your cluster safe from attackers with EDPF. Uh, I have some really cool stuff to show you. So really quick, I just wanted to kind of uh, you know, lay out like who this talk is, is really geared towards. Um, so we're, we're basically talking to the folks who are you know, responsible for running and, and maintaining a uh, Kubernetes uh, production environment. So, you know, this has multiple names, DevOps, cluster admin, what have you, uh, but we're kind of just, you know, targeting this talk to folks who are running a large production environment. Um, we know that you're, you know, interested in, in automating your security uh, because you're probably automating all the things. Um, you likely have some interest in security. Maybe you're not a security expert and that's kind of perfect. Um, and of course, when you're asked about your favorite text editor, um, you're, you know, probably going to be uh, suggesting Visual Studio Code, of course. We, we know the type. So what are we going to be talking about today? Um, well, we're actually going to be talking a little bit about how we can use cloud native kind of principles to actually bring in security to your environment. Um, and, and the thing to think about here is that cloud native security has a lot of potential built in. So unlike the days of running, you know, just standard jobs on VMs, um, we're obviously using things in Kubernetes like pods, and there's some benefits there. Like, for example, we can really heavily sandbox pods. Uh, so sandboxing isn't really a new concept. It's been, you know, uh, in things like Chrome OS and, and iOS for, for a while. Um, but we can utilize these sandboxing concepts um, to really kind of bring security into uh, cloud native. So, you know, I kind of list some things here like SecComp, AppArmor, um, you know, domain aware layer seven network policy. So basically what we can do is make sure that the pods that are actually running in the environment really only have access to the resources that we explicitly define. And we're kind of putting them in that sandbox. And this goes as far as, uh, you know, running things like uh, Firecracker or GVisor. Um, microservices kind of get a bad rap for bringing in additional uh, complexity, but they, there is potential there to bring in some simplicity from microservices. So for example, if you have you know, a minimal base image um, that you're using for your container, uh, you're basically providing a minimal attack surface as well. So you have a minimal amount of binaries. Um, and then you know, microservices kind of follow that Unix pattern of doing one thing and doing one thing well. Um, in addition to that, you think about it, you know, a microservice, uh, if the infrastructure is represented as code or if the application is represented in code, um, it's actually codified and you can, you can um, you know, be able to kind of reason as to what that what that code is doing, um, and then of course uh, we wouldn't uh, you know be here without saying that the observability is top notch, right? So eBPF um, really provides a, an optimal environment for container security observability, and um, in addition to that, uh, even some uh, you know uh, capabilities to uh, to protect the system as well as being able to observe some attacks. So with that said. You know, I wanted to talk a little quickly about some observability best practices. Um, so the first thing is that, you know, once you basically turn on the, the observability faucet, you, you, things can quickly become overwhelming. Um, so, you know, you're just gonna basically, if you look at the observability, uh, you, you're kind of looking at everything that's happening within that, within that environment. If you have, you know, a ton of microservices and you're scaling those microservices, you're essentially scaling what that observability looks like. Um, so we really wanted to lay out some best practices here um, to kind of help you in this journey. Um, the first thing that we'd recommend is like, you know, as we're, we're going over this stuff, like try not to focus on individual system calls. Um, if you've ever run S-trace on a machine, you know that it's system calls happen all the time. Um, and there's, there's a, a flood of data there. Uh, what we'd recommend from a security perspective is really to uh, try and focus on the patterns uh, of, of attacker behaviors. And this is you know, generally referred to as like TTPs in the world of security, which is techniques, tactics, and procedures. Um, but this really kind of lays out the patterns of, of attacker behavior. So for example, you know, I list some, some examples here. Um, so one is persistence. Like how do we actually maintain a foothold on a system? Um, privilege escalation, how do we basically go from non-root to root? Um, or maybe from a container to a node? Uh, lateral movement, like, you know, once we've actually popped a pod, how do we actually kind of, you know, uh, move laterally throughout the environment? And, and what we're actually going to be covering today and what Natalia is going to be showing us is this really uh, amazing demo to, to kind of 
break open that and, and take a look at some specific tactic, tactics, <laughs> techniques and procedures. So in this case, we're gonna be looking at a, a, a list out a couple of examples here. Like, you know, in, in the case of persistence, you might have a, you know, the root or, or maybe a, a standard users uh, authorized keys in SSH. Uh, obviously like this kind of gives you, um, you know, the ability to actually have long-term persistence and it might, you know, kind of circumnavigate things like IAM, et cetera, depending on your cloud environment. Uh, privilege escalation. So, you know, in the Etsy Kubernetes directory, you might actually have the, the PKI or, or access to the manifest there that would allow you to basically, you know, uh, potentially uh, escalate privilege or, or, you know, impersonate a specific Kubernetes uh, system. And then lateral movement, right? Like, so we might be able to look at things like, you know, network flow logs to, you know, 169.254, which is, uh, you know, generally referred to as the metadata server uh, based on the cloud environment. So what we're going to be showing today is not just how to observe, but how to actually stop um, the badness from occurring. Um, so we, basically what, we're, what we've advocated for so far is, you know, asking the kernel to watch over the system with eBPF um, to be able to identify and witness, um, you know, are we being attacked and, and what does that data actually look like? Um, but what if we could actually just ask the kernel to stop the attack instead of just, um, you know, looking at it? So from an environment perspective, let's assume that we have access to a GK cluster and that's what we can see on the terminal. And on the same cluster, I actually have Cilium set up and running, which monitors all the Kubernetes workloads. And with the help of eBPF, it also provides security, observability, and also enforcement for them. So in this specific scenario, with the help of eBPF, we are going to monitor specific system calls to a particular file and terminate the process if that specific system call was actually invoked. Um, in this specific case, we are going to monitor the sys write sys calls to the SSH authorized key file and kill the process if that sys call was actually executed. So in this case, we are going to observe and uh, monitor if someone externally would try to write into that file inside from a container, for example, insert, a, insert their public key, and we will try to um, kill that process and stop the badness. So now, the, now our main question will be, um, can we potentially create a backdoor to one of those nodes on the, on the GK cluster? So as a first try, I try to spin up a pod with a privileged equal true flag. Um, this should be enabled uh, by default on Kubernetes. And this removes all the sandboxing mechanism inside of this pod. So we can actually see the pod spec here. And then we can actually check that it is up and running. So we can see that it was actually created and running. And note that the privilege equal true is an extremely powerful thing since we got all the permission that the root user would have on the node. So we can try to exec into this pod. And then uh, we can actually check if we have resources on the host. Uh, we can check it by running cat proc partitions. And then we can see that the partitions that, is, that are listed here are actually partitions from the host. So now we can try actually mount one of the partitions inside to this container. Let's say this is SD1 and we will mount it under the TMP folder. So now we can actually inspect what is directly what is inside this mount. Maybe I can insert my public SSH key and get a backdoor. So let's just try to go into the SSH folder and then see what's there. We can actually find the authorized key file. I'm going to edit it uh, with Vim. And then Well, the process was killed. So what's actually happened, the generated eBPF program, which was actually monitor 
which was actually configured to monitor all the sysrights it's caused, which can happen to the authorized key file actually terminated the, the process. So that's what we can see, see on the terminal. And then if I try to add the authorized key file, we can see that actually nothing was inserted. So thank you for your time and uh, your attention to watch this talk. We will hold a short Q&A on this Slack channel and we will do a follow-up as well. Thanks everyone.